Yes, totally. Great. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for logging on and attending this morning's program. My name is Matt Schumann. I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Before we begin, there are a few things to note. Please let me know if there are any technical issues. Um, you can send those to me in the chat and I can try to resolve them for you. If you have any questions or comments, please submit them via the Q&A button and we will address them at the end. Um, this program is made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation. I'd like to now introduce Trisha perez Keneally. Trisha is the owner of the Inn at Hastings Park in Lexington, and she has been a major part of our cooking series uh, during the pandemic and throughout this year as well, uh, teaching us how to make a variety of wonderful, delicious dishes. Uh, Trisha will be back on Friday, June 4th, and you can sign up on carrylibrary.org. This program is also being recorded and will be on our YouTube page after. So please welcome Trisha. Good morning, everyone. I hope that everyone is enjoying this beautiful spring day. Um, it's hard to believe the variety of weather we've had in the week, but I guess that that's what makes New England so special. So we're getting ready to celebrate um, the mothers and all of the special women in our life this weekend with Mother's Day coming up. And I know that a lot of people like to celebrate the occasion with brunch. So what I was gonna share with you today were some really easy brunch tips um, that you can use either on Mother's Day or anytime throughout the year. So bacon is a big favorite in our house. Um, we have a theory in our house called Baconomics. And the theory basically means that people will eat whatever quantity of bacon that you make. So if you make two pounds of bacon, it's gonna disappear, even if there's only two or three people consuming said bacon. So what I'm doing right now is I'm using a really beautiful bacon from Pete and Jen's Backyard Birds. They raise their own pigs, as many of you have heard me talk about in Lincoln. So this is bacon, you know, some of their bacon. So it's a little bit of a thicker cut. Um, it doesn't have any nitrate or nitrites added to it. Um, you know, a lot of the larger processing companies use those products to help in the curing process, but Pete and Jen's bacon actually doesn't have that. And I find the easiest way to do the bacon if I'm cooking for a crowd, if I'm having a lot of people over for brunch, is to actually lay the bacon out on a cookie sheet as so. You can overlap it a little bit. And I'm gonna put this in a 400 degree oven. And in about 15 to 20 minutes time, I have one child who likes his bacon sort of on the softer side. I have another child who of course likes it on the crispy side. So we kind of watch and see, but that's probably a good amount of time. The other method, I'm just gonna pop this over in the oven over here that I also have been using, we go usually in non-pandemic times, we take a trip with a bunch of our friends from graduate school and all of our children. And it's about 35 people ranging in age from seven to 53. And we all cook together. And one of the things that we do is make a lot of bacon. So the other thing that I've been doing when I'm making bacon for 35 is I actually use what's called an immersion circulator. You might've heard me talk about the process of um, sous vide cooking under pressure. So basically what you're doing is you're using the immersion circulator to heat your water to a constant temperature and you insert whatever meat product you're cooking. And the thing about doing bacon is you can actually put the package of bacon in like as is, like if it's come in a Chirovac bag, you can just put that package of bacon in the water and I cook it at, one, at 145 and I basically leave it overnight. So it's basically, it is cooked, but it doesn't have that crispy texture. So all I do is then take the bacon, lay it out on the cookie sheets and finish it off that way. I don't normally do that if I'm just doing it for my family. But as I said, if I'm cooking it for a large number of people, it's another technique that you can try. So our bacon is cooking. The next thing that we're gonna do is I love French toast, but obviously standing at the stove and making individual pieces of French toast isn't necessarily the way that I would like to spend my Mother's Day morning. Um, and I know that there's sort of different theories of celebrating Mother's Day. I have some friends who Mother's Day is all about spending time with their children. I have other friends who Mother's Day is all about getting a day to themselves. I personally am in the spend time with my mother and my children doing what we love doing probably the best and that's hanging out and eating together. 
So this is a recipe that I've made a lot over the years. It's an apple French toast. Another thing that's really nice, um, sorry, it's, I, I make it an apple version, but today I'm making an orange version. So it's, it's a very versatile recipe. I'm cracking four eggs into the bowl. And then I actually have some fresh squeezed orange juice. Um, I think that this is probably Natalie's really good product um, that you can buy. Um, now you can get it at most supermarkets. They also um, do sell it at Wilson's. I'm going to be putting in a cup. So that's about half the bottle of my orange juice. One of the things that's really nice about this recipe is that there is no dairy in it. So if you have people in your life who like French toast but are lactose intolerant, this is the recipe for them. So I have at, taken the four eggs. I'm mixing it, whisking thoroughly with my orange juice. And you can add, I'm actually gonna add a little bit of almond extract today. Um, the recipe usually calls for vanilla, but I think that, that that orange almond combination is a really nice combination. And for some reason it's very springy to me. What's really nice about it too, is that you can use a whole variety of bread. Today, I have a beautiful multi-grain bread from Iggy's that I'm gonna use. And I have, I have about eight slices. I think six slices is probably going to be sufficient. I have a variety of pans here so I can demonstrate. You can use whatever you want, right? This is a nine inch cake pan. This is a traditional eight inch. Um, pan that we often use for brownie or bar cookies. If you wanted to make this as a present for somebody, you could use a disposable aluminum, aluminum tin, something like this, something square. You could use a pie plate um, if you had a really beautiful ceramic pie plate. So I'm just going to use the round one that I have here. And I'm going to spray it with a high quality cooking spray. Sorry. And if you, if you prefer, you could also use melted butter. I just recommend you know, using something that will prevent it from sticking. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my serrated knife because um, serrated knives are usually the best thing to use for bread. And I'm gonna cut these. If I were using a traditional square piece of bread, I probably would cut it on the diagonal to get triangles. But because these are more of that oval shape, I'm just gonna cut them down right in half. And I stack them, put them right through. And now what I'm gonna do is I am going to soak them, soak all of these pieces of bread in the French toast batter. And I can tell, I'm gonna flip this so you can see. I don't know if you can see, there's a lot of liquid in there that I have the ability, I'm gonna be able to use all of this bread. I had 10 pieces and I'm gonna be able to use it. And you really want to make sure that it's getting saturated. This is a stronger, uh, heartier bread. If I were using a white bread, it would be it would get pretty soft, but that's okay because the 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 milk and orange mixture, you know, is going to firm up when you bake it. So what I'm going to do, and I'm going to hold this up so you can see it, is I am going to lay the bread over itself. I'm sort of making a concentric pattern. And as I said, this is a really versatile recipe. In the fall, I love doing it with apple cider as well. And usually what I would say if you're serving other things with your brunch, about a, a piece and a half of bread per person, right? It also works really well with leftover challah. And if you happen to have, you know, bread that you want, you know, baguette, anything like that. It is a little bit more of the play um, on a very traditional pan perdu, which, you know, is the French version, you know, it's probably the original version of French toast, which they actually eat more frequently as a dessert, as opposed to a breakfast meal. I can smell the, the almond extract as well. If you were using fresh squeezed orange juice, you could also 
zest, take a little bit of that zest from the orange and that would be a nice added touch as well. So this is the pattern that I created. As you can see, it's pretty concentric. There is a little bit of liquid coming over. There's a little bit of liquid left in my bowl. So I'm just spreading it over using my hand, right? To just get that all over there. And then I'm gonna give a hearty sprinkle of, hearty sprinkle of cinnamon. I'm using, I'm just using a McCormick. Uh, it's a Vietnamese. Um, it's a Saigon cinnamon. If you buy your spices at, at Penzi's, they have some different strengths and they really do taste different. So if you ever have an opportunity to sort of do a head to head taste of some of the cinnamons, I would highly recommend doing that. I'm now going to put this in the oven and we're going to leave that for about 20 minutes. And I also am going to grab the camera and give you a quick peek at the oven. Can you see the bacon? As you can see, the bacon fat is coming, you know, releasing um, from the bacon. The bacon is staying flat. If you really, really wanted that flat, um, that flat bacon, the other thing that you can do is put a cookie sheet over it um, and then you would make sure that it stays flat. And that's what a lot of people in the restaurant trade do to keep their eggs flat. So while that is cooking, it helps to close the oven door. Um, I'm going to demonstrate a way to make scrambled eggs, larger quantities of scrambled eggs in a way that's a little bit gentler than what we normally do in the United States. So one of the first lessons that you have when you study at Le Cordon Bleu is all about eggs. And I think some of you may have heard me talk about that before. And what they do is they cook the eggs over a hot water bath. So what I have here on the side is a, I have a pot of boiling water and it's vigorously boiling. So what I mean by that is that I, there are bubbles everywhere. Um, after I crack the eggs, I'll show you what that looks like, what I mean by a vigorous boil. I'm cracking my eggs into this bowl. I'm gonna do about four eggs. And I have a silicon whisk at the ready. So if you've ever had the opportunity to travel to France and try their scrambled eggs, they're very soft, but they're not wet. And the way they achieve that is in some of the higher end restaurants, this is the way that they cook them. So I'm just gonna grab the camera to show you two things. That is what I mean by a vigorous boil, right? You see all of those bubbles. If I were talking about a simmer, I would barely want to see the water moving. These are my eggs. They're, you know, barely, you know, I just beat them gently. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to hold the camera here so that you can see what's happening. So I am gently cooking this over hot water bath. This is a technique that you would also use to do if you want it. This to me, like the hot water bath is the best technique that you would use if you were making lemon curd, if you were melting chocolate. What you're doing is you're insulating the, the ingredient that you're cooking. You're keeping it away from being right in contact with the heat. So you're preventing it from scorching, scalding, um, any of those things that are associated with burning a product. So as I said, these are four eggs. And what I have at the ready is I have some butter here on the table. I also have some cream. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add those at the end. The other thing that I could have, and I will bring the camera back as we get closer to the stage that we're looking for is you could have a variety of toppings waiting, right? So let's say for example, you wanted to include cheese. If I were doing this for a group of people, I might have ramekins laid out in, or pretty bowls and have in one, I would have like a combination of herbs, like maybe some chive, like really finely chopped chive and some other like parsley, things like that um, in one. 
I might have some cheese, maybe some Gruyere, some cheddar in another. And then perhaps I'd have some smoked salmon. And then if people wanted to add those toppings to their scrambled eggs, they certainly could. Another thing that I like to do is I love the filling in a quiche Lorraine. Um, and the, the secret to the, the quiche in France is that there's usually a hint of nutmeg, freshly grated nutmeg, and it tastes delicious. So the other thing that you could do is, and I'm a big fan of quiche Lorraine, so you could have some sauteed shallots and some bacon, a little bit of Gruyere cheese, and maybe a, you know, a freshly, just few fresh grates of that nutmeg and scramble that with your eggs and it would be delicious. And you're basically giving people that flavor of having the, um, the quiche without having to go through the fuss of making a short crust or, or dealing with a pre-made crust if you didn't wanna deal with that. So this isn't you know, the, fasted, the fastest method of, of scrambling an egg, but I do think that the result is worth it. And what I'm beginning to see, and I'm gonna just stir it for a few more minutes, and then I will bring the camera back over so you can see that the curds are beginning to form. While I'm doing that, does anybody have any questions about anything that I've done? Um, yeah, a couple have come in. Um, someone asked, what brand of cooking spray do you use? So this particular brand that I have here is called Sustain. Um, this is a sunflower spray that we use here in the restaurant. There's also a brand called Vigaline. I think that that's the way they pronounce it, um, that you can get at Williams Sonoma or Sur La Tabla. And I'm going to grab that camera because it's coming together quickly, which I absolutely love. Who said I couldn't cook and film at the same time? <laughs> so see, can you see the curd? So you remember what it looked like before, and now it's really sort of coming together. And you can see it's coming right off the bowl. Sorry, there you go. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually gonna add just a little bit of butter. I didn't add any butter before, um, before we started. So I'm gonna add a little bit of butter, and I'm also gonna add a little bit of cream. And I know that for a lot of people, this is sort of a raging debate, like do you add cream, do you add butter? It really is a matter of your personal preference. Um, I really feel that the butter adds a little bit, a, a really nice richness to it. This isn't necessarily something that I would do like every day. Like if I, I eat eggs, I probably eat two eggs a day. Um, that's kind of my go-to breakfast. I don't usually put butter and cream in my eggs on a daily basis like this but this is Mother's Day. So we really should enjoy and splurge. And what it does is it gives a really nice richness and creaminess to the egg. So right now what I'm doing is I'm mixing in that butter and that cream. While it's cooking off. One of the best scrambled eggs I ever had was at an amazing restaurant um, I actually think it was Mother's Day, which is so funny. Um, a lot of you may know that my family, we, when I was going to culinary school, I lived in London. And there are some amazing restaurants in London. And this one partic particular restaurant did scrambled eggs like this. And then they shaved truffles over the eggs. And they served the scrambled eggs in the most perfectly hollowed out, cleaned, beautiful eggshell. And it was the craftsmanship that was involved in creating that dish was just absolutely, absolutely incredible. Oh, these look so pretty. So I'm gonna put these in a bowl so I can see, I can show you what they look like. And again, like if you wanted to add cheese, you wanted to add salmon to make it scrambled eggs royale. If you wanted to add, you know, that cooked off shallot, bacon, a little bit of um, Gruyere and some nutmeg, you know, those are all of the variations. And I love having recipes like this that I can use as a foil to do a variety of things. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and put these in a blue bowl so you can see the contrast in the color. I have a little bit, I ground, you saw me grind a little bit of pepper. I'm gonna finish it off with a little bit of a Malden sea salt, sort of that coarser grind. 
And you do want to be careful that steam coming off of that pan, you will get a terrible, terrible burn. So you really do need to be careful when you're working with a hot water bath, when you release it and take it off um, of the flame. All right. So let me take this right to the camera. So you can see nice and soft, creamy, a little bit of that ground cracked pepper. And I will say that as a child, I was extremely particular about eggs. And I think that part of it is that I didn't like that taste. Um, I think that eggs get a really not, they don't taste great when they're overcooked. And I think that I was sort of reacting to that. And the reality is, is that in a lot of places that you might go to who are making, if you're going to a restaurant or whatnot, that's making high volume, a lot of times they're using a liquid egg product instead of using, you know, beautiful farm fresh eggs that we have access to here. So Matt, were there any other questions on the chat? Yes. Um, uh... What was the temperature of the oven for French toast? So I am cooking them together at 400, the bacon. You can get away with doing that. Ideally, you would cook the French toast at 350 and the bacon at 400. But just for the sake of the demo, I did it you know, together. And you could do that. If you wanted to split the difference, you could also put it in a 375 degree oven, recognizing that your French toast will take um will probably take a little less time and your bacon will take a little bit more time and i actually have the recipe that i will share with matt and he could po he could send that to all the participants today recognizing that if you prefer apple to orange you could just replace that orange juice with apple cider uh, another one was what is the bowl made out of that you put over the boiling water so if you're doing a hot water bath you this is a metal bowl but you also could use a glass bowl and that applies to like if you're melting chocolate um, or doing anything like if you're making a lemon curd or doing anything that needs to be cooled. A hot water bath is also a great method. People always ask around Thanksgiving or any of the holidays, what can I do if I wanted to make my mashed potatoes ahead of time, but I want to keep them warm? A really great way to keep your mashed potatoes warm and smooth is to create a hot water bath with barely simmering water. So you would want a bigger pot than this, maybe your soup pot, if you have that, that, that bigger soup pot. Um, and a bigger bowl, put your mashed potatoes in the bowl, cover it with aluminum foil, maybe put a little bit of butter and cream over the top of the mashed potatoes, and then put them on that hot water bath. They will be perfectly warm, hot, actually they'll, they'll be hot, not warm. Um, and it's just a great way to be able to have really nice mashed potatoes um, when, you're doing, when you're doing that. Knowing how to use a hot water bath is a really good skill to have in your repertoire. Um, and again, especially for chocolate. Um, I know that a lot of recipes say, oh, just you know, melt the chocolate in the microwave. The problem is, is that chocolate is a very temperamental product and you can very quickly scald it without knowing it. And what will sometimes happen is you'll get, there'll be a gray color, like the chocolate will bloom. Like you'll basically see some of that whiteness coming out. And that basically means that you've overheated your chocolate. So if you have the time, it doesn't really take much longer use the hot water bath. It's just a much gentler way of cooking some of these products and working with them. Um, and then the last question that had come in so far was how much milk did you use for the French toast? Um, I used, um, a I, I did not use any milk in the French toast. So that was one of the point, one of the reasons why I like this recipe. This is a dairy free recipe. So what I did was I used a cup of orange juice and four eggs and I use 10 pieces of bread uh, because of the, the size of the bread. So you kind of have to, the whole objective is that you want to use enough bread to soak up all of the liquid, the, the batter. Um, and for this particular recipe, it was 10 pieces of, it was a loaf of Iggy's bread that I used um, to make it. So you just kind of want to play with it. But that is the key to this recipe. It does not have dairy in it. And what we're recognizing here in the restaurant is that more and more um, it's becoming you know, a lot of people have, it just seems that a lot more people are aware that they have sensitivities to dairy. Um, so that, you know, that's why I think this recipe really is a great thing for feeding a crowd, especially, you know, if you're having a lot of people at the house and you don't know what everyone's, even though they may be family, you don't know everybody's food sensitivities. This is a great way to have 
a recipe that, you know, as I would describe it, kind of satisfies a variety of people. Uh, there was one more person that had their hand raised. If you, um, if you want me to unmute them and they can ask directly. Perfect. That's great. Uh, Paula, that um, Paula and Tita. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, I'm gonna allow. I'm gonna. Yeah, you should be able to talk. You should just have to unmute yourself. You know, I think I think I I hit the button by mistake. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry. Oh no, don't worry. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna take a walk over and take a look at the bacon. Oh yeah. So this bacon I could tell would satisfy, I think I would satisfy a few members of my family. I'm gonna just grab my tongue so I can pick up the bacon and you can see what it looks like. Sorry, bad camera work. No Oscars for me. There we go. Maybe they should come up with the Zoom awards for all of the programming we've done, right? <laughs> we can call them the Zoomies. Yeah. Okay. So this is perfect that you can see. Look at that piece of bacon. Like that is a perfectly cooked piece of bacon, right? So I have sort of crispier pieces on the side. I have sort of some softer pieces in the middle. I flip those over. And the other thing too is that this bacon fat is like pure gold for cooking, right? If you have never had a fried egg cooked in bacon fat, you are missing out. Um, growing up in Puerto Rico, that is the way my grandmother always made eggs and she used the, the bacon fat. The beautiful thing too is that it's, it's actually, you can save the bacon fat, you can cook potatoes in it, you can, you can do just about, you can do so many things. You can fry fish in it, you can do so many things. And it's actually, it's not, it, it's, not a, it's not unhealthy because it's actually sort of a pure fat. Does that make sense? Um, obviously, I don't want you eating a, fat, a vat of bacon fat, but used in moderation to cook your eggs, to cook those potatoes. It really, it really is a really good thing. So that is the bacon. And what I would be doing too is I would have, um, I would have another, I would first transfer to a plate with paper towel to blot it out and take out the grease. Um, and we would be good to go with that. Um, now, the other thing that I wanted to show you is I wanted to show you our French toast. Let me just grab my oven mitts or a dish towel. So one thing too is like oftentimes you will see me using dish towels. We use them a lot in the kitchen. Oh, look at that. You might not have seen the healthy dose of, dose of cinnamon that I, that I put on there. But what I also love about this too, is that this also presents really nicely because what I can do is I can just cut this into wedges. If I were putting this on a buffet, I could cut it into eight and people could serve themselves the wedges. I would serve this, I could serve this with fresh berries. I could serve it with maple syrup. It's actually flavorful enough on its own that you could just serve it and people could eat it, you know, similar, as I said, to a pound per or a bread pudding, although it's less custardy than what we usually associate um, with a bread pudding here in this country. So there's my quick brunch and the whole, you know, what I wanted to sort of prove to people is, as I said, it's always that on Mother's Day, am I entertaining my mother or am I being entertained? But what I like about this recipe is we cooked for about 33 minutes. We have bacon, we have a French toast, something sweet, we have scrambled eggs, and now I can sit down and enjoy my time with my guests. Well, thank you, Tricia. Uh, oh, another question has come in. Um, and if Thanks. anybody else has questions, feel free to type them in. Somebody asked, what's the best way to store that bacon fat? The best way to score, store that bacon fat, I am a big fan, although I know there's been a huge shortage of them. So I save peanut butter jars and I love mason jars. So a mason jar is a fantastic um, vessel for saving that because you wouldn't want to put it into a plastic container, especially when it's this hot, it will melt that container. But a glass jar, any sort of glass jar that you could reuse is a perfect container for storing that bacon fat. Um, it's really good like with fingerling potatoes. If you were doing like a roast or a barbecue, you know, toss, you know, you could just melt the bacon fat in a saucepan and then toss the potatoes in it and bake them off in the oven. 
you know, likewise, another thing that I could make to complement this is I could make a really simple, easy hash. I could chop up some fingerly potatoes, chop up an onion, some colored pepper, toss it all in the bacon fat, put it in a single layer, pop it in the oven, even at the same temperature. So I could do like the hash, the bacon, and the French toast all at the same time, and I would have a complete meal. And I sometimes to the hash, I, I will sometimes add like an apple chicken sausage to it as well, um, if you wanted to kick up the level of protein in the meal. There was another question too. Um, do you store that in the fridge, freezer, or countertop? Um, I, um, I tend to put the bacon fat in the refrigerator. The freezer might, you know, the freezer will extend the longevity of it. Um, the countertop, if you're going to use it in a matter of two or three days, I think is fine. Um, I think here in the United States, you know, I don't store my eggs in the refrigerator and people think that that's absolutely crazy, but in Europe, they don't really do that. And I, um, I know where my eggs are coming from. My eggs are coming from local farms so they're nice and fresh. So, you know, in terms of the bacon, your best bet is probably in the refrigerator, but don't get overly fussed if you've left it on the counter for a few days. And someone else asked, how can you keep the bacon hot if the other dishes are not ready? So I am lucky that I have sort of a two oven setup. So I would keep the bacon warm by putting it at a 200, a 200 oven. The alternative is, is that the surprisingly, the French toast will hold its heat longer than the bacon. So if you wanted to one of the biggest challenges people have when they're beginning to entertain and do a lot more cooking in terms of their entertaining is organizing all of the cook time so that everything ends up at the same time. So what you need to think about is what can hold its heat, right? So that French toast, that casserole can hold its heat a little bit longer or a lot longer than a slice of bacon. So what I would do is let's say I wanted to serve my brunch at 10 a.m. at 9.20, I would put in the French toast at, the, at 350. I would cook off my French toast. I then would put the temperature up on the oven to 400 and then put in the bacon, knowing that in the 20 minutes that I need, it'll still hold its heat. And then I could put the bacon and the French toast on the table at the same time. Does that make sense? So the best thing to do is kind of make a list of all of the things that you're going to cook, figure out oven times and cook times, and make yourself a grid and organize yourself as to how, um, how that would work. Obviously, a lot of us here in Lexington are really lucky that we do have a two oven setup. If you have a toaster oven, toaster ovens are invaluable, right? You can put it on 200, keep it in low, you could put that bacon in there and you could keep it warm there too. You just need to be, you know, a little bit creative. Uh, another question that came in is, uh, and I think that you've done a fabulous job of uh, being a PR person for bacon today, but um, what is the brand of bacon again and where did you get it? So um, I bought this bacon from Codman Farm in Lincoln. So Codman Farm has a 24-7 honor store. Um, it's open, um, it's self-serve. Um, you go in and you basically, you scan all your product and you go off. So they have eggs, they have bacon. There's also some great bacon products, different bacons um, at Wilson's. Um, you know, some of the bacon, you can find Northwood bacon now. I think they have it at Market Basket. That's also a really good product. So, you know, I'm really lucky. We're really lucky to have access to some really talented farmers who raise livestock. So if you haven't had the opportunity, I would encourage you to try the products from Codman. They raise cattle, they raise lamb, they raise pork, they raise chickens. Uh, we're now coming into the season where, they're, where, where they will have their farm fresh eggs. And when they have enough supply, those are usually the fresh eggs that we serve um, in the restaurant here at the inn. Um, and then there's a comment. Uh, someone said that they read that eggs have that have not been washed can be stored on the counter, but once they are washed, uh, the washing apparently removes the protective layer and refrigeration is recommended. Do you have a comment on that? Um, I will confirm that with my chick like my friends. So I think a lot of people know that for a long time, the Wilsons had chickens at the farm. Um, so what I will do is I will call two of my trusted egg farmers. I will call Pete and I will call Jim Wilson. <laughs> 
and I'll ask them and then I'll let Matt know. Um, Cause I actually, I have heard about that, but I, I don't, I, I want to make sure that I'm giving you the correct answer. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Trisha, for taking time out of your busy day to show us uh, how to make a wonderful Mother's Day brunch. And I hope that you uh, also get a delicious brunch on Mother's Day. Well, I will be spending um, most of my weekend here at the Inn because we're actually <laughs> really busy. Um, we're we're going to be doing quite a few covers. Um, the one thing that I would ask is, please, please come check us out at the Inn. We have a beautiful, um, a lot of you have heard me talk about the igloos. Our igloos have now become our culinary garden. Um, we've planted some beautiful um, there's some beautiful Japanese maple. We have Rose of Sharon. We have four flower beds that have a variety of herbs. They'll be growing with pick and grow again flowers that we're going to be using to decorate our tables as well as our guest rooms. Um, it does fe feel like the world is beginning to open up again. And the one thing that I ask on behalf of all of the business owners in Lexington is please, please, please shop local as much as you can and come out and support um these local businesses you know we're really working hard to be creative to to provide offerings that people feel comfortable with we have tables on our porch we have tables in the garden we're happy to do takeout um, if you want to have a family celebration and you want to do it in a more private setting we can do that as well um, all that i ask is like please as i said shop local um, it's your neighbors that you're supporting and it really truly does make a difference so thank you Someone did just ask if they're uh, able to make uh, reservations for Mother's Day or tomorrow at least. So we may have a few reservations left for tomorrow, but we are completely sold out for Sunday. Um, it was a very high quality pro problem to have. Um, but remember that we offer champagne brunch every Saturday and Sunday. Um, so please, if you can't join us this week, um, join us for brunch at another weekend or come and join us for dinner. There are some amazing, amazing new things on our menu. Um, our new chef, Jordan Bailey. Um, there's some fantastic seafood. There's a, a seafood naj dish um, that's on our menu. It's all different types of shellfish. And it's one of the best dishes that I've, that I've ever tasted. It was so absolutely delicious. And this is the time of the year when cooking gets to be even more fun because every week is like a tre treasure trove. Every week there's new product. Like right now we're seeing local asparagus. Um, we're beginning to see um, there's rhubarb that's coming into season. As the weeks progress, we're gonna see that progression of the strawberries. The harvest of the strawberries is gonna get closer and closer and closer until it finally gets to this region. Um, so this is one of the best times of the, I love like springtime because I love like asparagus and berries and rhubarb. Um, the other favorite time of year, I love tomatoes and apples. So the, and corn. So at the end of the season is also really fun for me, but we are so lucky to have so many local farms here in Lexington and the surrounding community. So again, please too do what you can to support them as well. Um, you know, this hasn't been easy for any of us, but, um, we're almost there. The light's at the end of the tunnel. Thank you again, Trisha. Thank you again for taking time out of your busy weekend. And thank you, everyone. It's my pleasure. So I wish everyone, all the moms, all the people who, anyone who has a mother-like relationship um, with the people in their life, I hope that you have a very, very special Mother's Day weekend. And I'll look forward to welcoming as many of you as possible in the near future um, back to the end. So thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Tricia. Thank you, everyone, for attending.